Welcome to the Soul Craft Your Life podcast. My name is Carmen Marshall, and I'm a life design and manifestation expert, a seven-figure entrepreneur, wellness educator, and a dance teacher. And I'm passionate about helping you create a magical and fulfilling life. Whether you want to discover your purpose, learn how to attract financial abundance, or create more health, balance, joy, and connection in your life, the Soul Craft Your Life podcast has got you covered. One part strategy and one part soul. Each week we explore both the practical and the spiritual with intriguing experts and fascinating human beings, all sharing their wisdom to help expand what we think is possible for our own lives. The goal? To help you create a life you love on your own terms that stems from your soul. Let's dive in and discover what this life has to offer each of us. Hello, gorgeous souls. Welcome to episode 15, which is all about reinventing yourself with John Morrell. Now, I originally wanted to interview John about opening and creating a successful passion and lifestyle business. He's the owner of Jets Noosa, our favorite gym where we live in Australia. But when I sat down to do a pre-interview chat with John, I realized there's so much more to him that I wanted to share. He's led an extraordinary life, and he's truly a master of reinvention with a unique attitude that has helped him pivot successfully time after time. So a little backstory. A high school dropout, John first created a successful career in the hospitality and nightclub industry in Victoria. But after his life was threatened and fearing for the safety of his family, he knew it was time for a change. So then, as a burly biker with earrings, tattoos, and a ponytail, he completely reinvented himself as an entry-level salesperson for the famous music retailer Brashers, and he worked his way up to the state manager for the whole of Queensland, winning numerous retailing awards. Living the dream, he was touring with the Rolling Stones, he bought birthday presents for Celine Dion, he traveled with the Brisbane Broncos. But in the midst of living the dream, his marriage broke down and he knew it was time for significant change. So he left Brashers and he bought a Harvey Norman franchise, which is the equivalent to a Best Buy in the US. He moved to Noosa and then he went from newbie franchise owner to building the most profitable store in Queensland. But while he was working less hours, his lifestyle hadn't changed. He was still smoking a pack a day. He was overweight. He was on antidepressants. He slept with a sleep apnea machine. And after a suspected heart attack at 44, he knew he needed a complete lifestyle overhaul, which led him to The Biggest Loser, applying and getting accepted to season three of The Biggest Loser in Australia, losing 47 kilos, which is 103 pounds, keeping it off for over 14 years now and being a healthy, fit inspiration to so many. And of course, now owning one of the most successful gyms in Australia. And the rest I will leave for the interview. I'm looking so forward to introducing John to you. He puts 100% into everything he does. He really lives life to the full. He's present, he has a huge heart, and so many insights into successful reinvention. All right, let's dive in. So John, I am so excited to have you on the podcast. Obviously, you are my favorite gym in the whole of Nusa. I think we've been going to your gym for a couple of years now since we've been here. But I really wanted to bring you to the podcast because you are the perfect person to talk about reinvention. You have reinvented so many times, and I think it's just such a good topic in today's world because so many of us are needing to pivot, we're needing to reinvent, we're needing to change our lives, our business. But before we get started, can you tell our listeners where you are in the world? So firstly, I'd like to get a bit of clarification on you saying it's the best gym in Noosa. I thought it was the best gym in the world for you. (laughs) Okay, yes, yes, I'll re-say that. It's the best gym in the world. (laughs) Right, fantastic. I'm glad you gave us a bit of clarity on that one. Well, currently I'm sitting in what I call my quiet room in my home in Noosa Heads, Queensland, Australia. I don't know how far this podcast goes out. And enjoying my little quiet space. It's just a room that's quiet, has looks out into the garden. And if I want to switch off from the world, I come and sit here and do all my thinking, basically. Mm, beautiful. And I know you've got so many plans. Every time I come into the gym, you've got something new that you're cooking up. So we'll talk about that as well. But let's dive into your story. There's so many times that you've reinvented. What would you say is one of the most important times, probably from your earlier years? I probably think when I jumped out of the hospitality industry, so I got to a point where I was running some relatively big nightclubs 
back in Victoria in Melbourne. And I had a, a knife held to my throat one particular night and it kind of escalated. And at that point, I realized that it was time to get out of that industry. I started off in that industry as a bouncer when I was 17 years old. And then it just become too life-threatening. I'd been shot at once. I had been stabbed before. And at that stage, I was a father and I was a very young father. I had my daughter upstairs in the hotel that we were, I was running at that stage. And then I just made the decision to say that this is time now. I need to move on. My responsibilities have changed in life. I'm a parent and this is not a great environment to be around. And although I was only young, I kind of figured I'm getting too old to be fighting people, So, <laughs> <laughs> which I probably really wasn't. So then I just had to change and get out of it. I mean, I loved it because of the music. So I then had to find another path that would take me down that road after leaving live band venues. And what did you go to? So there was a company, a, a great Australian company by the name of Brashes Music. Um, and they were around for about 140 years. And they had music stores selling cassettes and CDs and things like that. And they also had hi-fi systems and TVs. So because they had music, and that's my love and that's my passion, I really thought if I can get into this company and try and grow and develop with them, that I may get to live my dream. I play the drums and I can sing, but I've never put myself into a category where I was good enough. Well, I thought I was good enough to really take it any further. And I got caught up working as, at a young age. So anyway, I saw this advertisement for a sales, but the, the ad read salesperson or manager experience required. And I'd never sold anything in my life. Well, I didn't know I'd sold anything in my life, but I had the management experience. So I applied for this role. And funnily enough, the business was a retail business compared to hotels. So if you could imagine John has rocked up to the interview on a chopper motorcycle with a ponytail, a long goatee beard, two earrings into a job where you're now wearing virtually a suit and tie back in those days. And surely I got a lot of looks up and down. And <laughs> so I went for this gig and one guy took a punt on me and he said, I'll give you two weeks to show me that you can sell. And of course, I showed him that I could sell. And then that was the starting of my career in Brasher's music. So when you made that change, was it hard and why I say that is for most of us, even if we know we need to make a change, it can be really hard. Like whether, you know, it's family, what we're worried about that we have to support. So what was it like for you to make that change, even though you knew that you needed to? So the hardest part of making that change was I had to make a decision about how I looked and how I presented. And that was the first decision I had to make. And I remember who I would still call my greatest mentor to this day. He taught me how to sell and he always wore a suit without a doubt. He'd always have his suit on. And if it was 30, 40 degrees heat, you would only ever have a long sleeve shirt on. Now, could, no one could ever understand why. We just thought he presented himself so well. Anyway, I went to through Monash University and did a retail study course, a management course. And he came up to me one day and he said, listen, John, people look at you and they have this perception of who you are. I'm not telling you to do this, but I think you need to maybe think about your hair, think about riding your chopper motorcycle to work. And it was particularly in Melbourne head office because I used to park it right out the front. So everyone seen me rock up. <laughs> and I kind of turned around him and I said to him, you know what, David, this is just silly. You're never going to change the person in. You can change the way I look, but you're never going to change the person that I am. I'm still the same person. But being so young and naive, I didn't get the perception of what other people see. So he said to me, I'm going to show you something. And he rolled up his sleeves and he had, now back then, unusual, full sleeve tattoos on both arms. And he said, no one ever sees these tattoos. They don't because people will judge you. So it kind of really resonated. I thought to myself, you know, that's very interesting because really it's a haircut. It's taken an earring out. It's shaving back a goatee beard and doing some pretty simple things in life. And the reality is, it isn't going to change the person that I am because I am still going to be the same person. So basically, I learned that you really had to groom yourself. I had to groom myself to take this next step. And that I did. So I had two earrings. I took one out. The one I left in, I left because my father did it when I was 15 years old with a needle and a cork. Um, so that was a bit of an emotional <laughs> attachment for me. But yeah, that was the hardest point. Changing businesses to me was relatively easy. It was 
to me, when you try and, well, I call it reinvent myself, when you reinvent yourself, you just need to learn the product and understand the product. But if you have a certain skill, you can take that wherever you go. Mm. So important though, because I think that's also for any of us trying to reinvent, it is, it's like a new skin, it's a new outfit, it's a new being. So there is that like, ugh period as you're adjusting to it, or you might even have to adjust in a way that doesn't feel quite comfortable. We just have to make those decisions to make changes. And they're not that hard, really. When you put it into perspective, it's not a hard change to make. Yeah. But being willing to do that and being willing to listen as well. Sometimes I think it's hard to take other people's input, but being humble enough to say, you know, okay, maybe I'll take that on. Correct. I mean, I kind of have that personality that when somebody says something like tap that to me, I get my back up. I don't argue, but I'll go away and take away and think about it and go, you know what? They are right. And you need to do that. So yeah, so I pretty well adopted that through most of everything that I did. You've just got to, what you see is not always what you've got. And you just have to be disciplined and stay true to who you are at all times. And that's what people want. So then from there, you went into more bigger retail. Can you talk about the transition from Brashers into the next epic of your life? Well, starting with Brashers, so I started off as a salesperson in Victoria and climbed fairly quickly up the ladder of sales. I found it really easy. I actually loved it. To me, it's it's like customer service. You're just giving the customer what they want and you've got to listen. I you know, I always believe that the two ears, one mouth, listen twice as much as what you speak when it comes to sale, listen to what people are telling you. And then it's very easy to present what they want if you listen to what they need. So the sales become quite easy. And then I moved into management pretty quickly. My regional manager said to me, you know, what's the next step? I'd finished a store in, in Melbourne. And I said, look, I'm, I'm interested in going to Queensland to live. I moved up to Queensland when I was younger, but then I went back to Melbourne again. And he said, oh, there's a store in Bundle. And I'd never heard of Bundle, but it It was on the Gold Coast. So I was pretty happy to hear it was on the Gold Coast. So I said, yes, I'm there. And then it evolved from there to looking after a few stores on the Gold Coast, then became a divisional manager. And Brashers were really strong within the music industry. So we were bringing a lot of people to Australia at that stage. We sponsored Tom Jones. We sponsored Celine Dion. We sponsored the Rolling Stones Voodoo Lounge Tour. So they had to do this opening ceremony or or gig with all the suppliers for the Rolling Stones presentation night, which was at ANZ Stadium. And the other guy that was also a divisional manager, he was the one that would always present at these events. And I'd never done it. I was pretty nervous, really hadn't spoken in public much at all. But because this was music, I thought, you know what, I'm going to take ownership of this. And I walked into his office and said, I'm doing the presentation for this Rolling Stones opening gig. And he sort of looked at me and said, well, you know, you're not. And I said, well, yes, I am. This is part of music. You don't look after music. You look after electrical. And all he could kept saying to me, don't drop the ball. Don't drop the ball. And I said, I'm going to do this. So I went in out shopping and I went into Myers in in Queen Street and I bought a Voodoo Lounge Rolling Stones tie. (laughs) And it kind of became my lucky tie. And I wore it at the presentation And it was the first time I'd really got up in front of a crowd of people. I used to speak with my teams and teach and train my teams, but absolutely smashed it, just nailed it. And it was one of the best presentations that happened across Australia. And then the following week, I got promoted to state manager of Queensland. So I jumped over this guy and ended up looking after 26 music and electrical stores in Queensland. But I got to hang out with Celine Dion. I had to put a birthday party together with her, with Sony Music. And it was just extraordinary. I was living my best. Mm. And that was around mm. 94, 96. And I swear it was, I haven't done, well, I've done a lot of things, but it was an extraordinary moment in my life that I'll never, ever forget. And it was, mm-hmm. yeah. so I'd made it. I got to where I wanted to get to in that industry. From that point there, Harvey Norman, for those that don't know, is a very big electrical retailer in Australia. Well, they're actually the biggest now and they keep approaching me to come across and music started to change. iTunes was happening. Sales were dropping. So the writing became on the wall. Spotify was kind of peeking around the corner. So yeah, the writing was there. And my biggest quote that over, stupidest quote I ever made in my life was, iPods won't work. They won't work. People still want to go and buy a record. They still (laughs) want to go and buy a cassette and all of that stuff. But Sure enough, it virtually worked. 
<laughs> You're not the only one. My, I had someone very close to me that said, yoga will never become mainstream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's very it goes funny. up there with like the internet will never be a big thing. So that we all say something. <laughs> Um, yeah, so they kept approaching me, and then I, um, the as I said, the writing was on the wall, and I had a meeting with Jerry Harvey and his wife, and they said, "Look, we have this store in Noosa Heads that was going to open in 1999. Are you interested in coming across?" So at that stage, I'd made the decision. I said, "Jeff, it's time to reinvent, time to move out of there and get into the strongest retailer in Australia again." But I had to give up my music, and that was a really tough thing to do. So anyway, they made a plan for me and they said to me, look, we want to send you up to Toowoomba first and we want to buy a standalone business that's not under their brand and we want you to run this business. We'll give you 100% autonomy, put all your own marketing plans together, your own branding together. It was called Burnoff Electrical and I actually competed against Harvey Norman. So what they wanted to see was could they can compete against each other in the same geographically environment. And sure enough, it did. It worked. So that was kind of where they started to move into owning Joyce Main and Domain. And then realistically, they have the monopoly of the electrical business in Australia to this day. I think good guys sort of sit around there. So I did that and it worked. And then they gave me Noosa Heads. So that was the deal. But they also wanted a boutique store in Noosa Heads. So lo and behold, there was a few music stores that had closed down. And I had this really this area in the store that just was really hard to work anything. And one of my team members said to me, why don't you put a music shop in here? And I thought, oh, I still had the contacts with the suppliers and stuff like that. And I spoke to Jerry and he said, well, why do you want to do that? And I said, we've got this dead space. I reckon I can pull it off and it's only going to bring traffic to the store. So I ended up going ahead with it. And there's the funny thing. I'll never think this really resonates with me and never will, it always will. I rang Jerry back a second time to ask him a question. And he turned around and he said to me, John, you've told me what you want to do. Start it and tell me when it's completed. If you believe in this project, then I'm happy to support it, but I don't need to know what's going on in the middle. Just go ahead and do it. So I organized my browsers, organized my record company. The hardest thing was it was November. So December, January, February at the busiest times of the year for music. And so if you miss that moment, it can become a battle. So we worked 48 hours straight and created an entire list of what music we we're going to put into this store, in the retail store, which had never been done in Harvey Norman before. And we put this whole playlist together, put the order in, and sure enough, we opened in November. And that was 2002. 2003, we became the most profitable store in Queensland. And it worked. It worked really well. And then, again, with reinventing things, and particularly in business, you have to take risk and you have to back your knowledge and what you know. Then the Plasma TV came out and it was worth $24,500. Very simple Plasma TV, nothing special, but it hadn't been released in store yet. And they were putting them in into stores and they were grading them as in an A grade, B grade, C grade store. It wasn't based on demographic. It was based on store size. So my store was a relatively small size store. But demographically, it was a very wealthy area. But they still wouldn't give it to me. So I debated it and I really fought hard and I did get that plasma. I went to the managing director, Phillips. He was on my floor for 20 minutes and we sold it for $24,999, the first plasma sold in Australia. Wow. Crazy. So that kind of just took our, our store to another level. And then I got asked to be on the what they call a steering committee, which is the national buying committee. So then you're traveling to Japan career and you're dealing with LG and Sony, all of those with electrical and you're buying TVs and and various other things. So then that was that was pretty well my Harvey Norman world and, and it was great. So between my music world and all my retail world, it was just constant traveling, hanging out with rock stars, going overseas, hanging out with sporting stars. It was extraordinary. It was just an extraordinary part of my life. But one thing I never lost sight of was me is I never stopped believing who I was. We had moments, unlike anybody, you stand there and you question your abilities or you question who you are. But I just would always just put things into perspective and go, well, you know what, this is where you've got. And I'm a high school dropout. You know, I left school when I was 15 years old. So I'm not the smartest or the sharpest tool in the shed, as they say. 
and this is where I get back to the word you ask, is a person smart? Well, you don't have to be academic to be smart. Um, so I just, yeah, so I just thought to myself, you know, I'm pretty smart with making decisions. I analyze things. So I just always would pull myself back to that to say, you know, John, you've made these decisions in the past. They have worked. If you don't back yourself, and if you don't believe in yourself, well, why would you expect somebody else to do that? Mm, such an important takeaway for any entrepreneur starting, has been in the business for a while, whatever it is, to back yourself and to go out on a limb. And I think especially if it's linked to something that you really believe in, like music or something that you love, that's where your heart is. It makes it so much easier when you're backing that thing that you believe in. Yeah, agree. Agree totally. So, yeah, so that's what I've generally done is back myself. And then life went on for there. But the funny thing was, is within that whole time, there was also other things happening in my personal world. So I went through a divorce and that was probably the hardest moment in my life. It wasn't just the divorce. It was the fact that I wasn't going to see my children every day of the week, going to work and coming home from work. And I kind of become that part-time father, which sort of hurt a fair bit. Financially, I went backwards, which made it also hard. And then I fell into a relatively deep depression. But the work was what got me through that. But yet I would come home and I'd be absolutely miserable. I ate a lot. I drank a lot. I had sleep apnea. I was wearing a mask, so I couldn't sleep. I was on to my second marriage at that stage. And yeah, it was like sleeping with Darth Vader. Um, so <laughs> I promise you there wasn't a lot of romance going on back yeah. then either. Huh. So yeah, so that's where I got to with all this fun and all this partying. And, you know, people always say, because well, I became extremely overweight and, you know, everyone would ask the, you know, talk about the question, you've got these emotional problems and realistically the depression was there, but that's not why I became overweight. I just had virtually a life of partying for many, many years within the music and within the electrical business. You've got the social aspect, the, the drinking, the eating, the everything that goes along with that. Then if you throw in, you know, depression and, and not getting enough sleep, that's just an added. So what happened from there? What did that create for you? Again, it was one of those moments where I knew my world had to change. I had a suspected heart attack and I got taken to Budrum Hospital. It was basically, I had extremely high blood pressure, which was, was I forget the medical term that they use now. A very high hypertension. Hypertension. Mm. Virtually off a scale, the doctor said, I can't believe that you've survived this, particularly with your weight, particularly with your sleep apnea. I was on antidepressants and I was smoking 60 cigarettes a day if it was a day on the drink. If I wasn't drinking, I was consistently smoking 30 cigarettes a day. I was a mess. Mentally, in business, I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof because I loved what I did and I was confident with what I did. But as a person, I had no confidence in myself as a person. I thought I was, you know, I was bullied as a kid. I was the fat kid. I, I never had many girlfriends, blah, blah, blah. Business was my life and I always felt confident in that. So I basically hit the wall in every single angle and I had to pull myself together. And I thought, if I stay in the job that I'm in, nothing's going to change. I'm still going to be doing 100 hours a week. I'm still going to be going out to lunches and dinners and traveling overseas and doing all that stuff. I have to change. So I made the decision to get out of retail and quit, which was really unusual because the way Harvey Norman's structure worked, you just didn't quit because it was, I remember going in and saying, well, I don't want to do this anymore. And they just looked at me and it's going, are you serious? Because it was a really good money making business for you as what they call a proprietor back then. But I knew I had to make that change. So I got a job as an advertising manager for a company and I was doing that for eight months. But the problem was it was still the same. I was still going for The difference was I wasn't working 100 hours a week. I was working a normal weekend. So there was no weekend work, which was great. Monday to Friday, nine to five, that was the massive change. But I was still going out for long lunches because I was dealing with that level of person that were owning companies and stuff like that. So... The crazy thing, and I still, I just, I can't even answer. I don't know the reason why this happened, but I was on my computer one day in my office um, and I was working on a, fresh, a fashion magazine. This pop-up came up for The Biggest Loser on the screen, Contestants Now Wanted. And I really knew nothing about this program. I, in fact, knew nothing about reality TV. And I, I clicked on it and then all of a sudden it opened up and it's going, you know, this is what the show is. It's it's about weight loss and 
all of that. And I've kind of got off my chair and I went and closed my office door. And I thought, I'm going to continue to go further with this. I got a little bit excited about it because for me, it was about, I knew that if I fell off the face of the earth, I could take control of everything. But if I knew if I stayed in the position I was in now, nothing would change. So I filled out an application form, ran outside, grabbed one of my photographers and said, I need a photo of me. Of course, he had to do a pretty big wide angle because I was 150 kilos at that stage. I mean, I hadn't told anybody and I didn't want to tell anybody, but it was Father's Day and I got invited to go to a casting meeting. So now I'm sitting in my lounge room with my two daughters and my wife at that stage, my second wife. And I said, guess where I'm going tomorrow? This was a Sunday. And they said, where? I said, well, I'm going for a casting meeting with The Biggest Loser. And my kids just freaked out. They've gone, you're kidding me. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And my wife has just looked at me. She said, you're what? (laughs) And I said, well, I saw this thing and I want to have a look at it. And it's a weight loss TV thing. And I need to do this. I need this to help me go forward. And then I'm talking through this whole scenario. My youngest daughter turned around and said, Dad, do you realize that you can actually win $250,000 on this show? Time for a quick commercial break. Hi, this is Carmen and I'm sponsoring myself. And since this topic is so related to meaning and purpose, I wanted to encourage you to go to my website and there you'll find my official Soulcraft quiz to discover what your soul's really craving. It's only seven questions, so it'll take you two to three minutes max, and it will help you hone in on what your soul really wants. Hint, the answer may surprise you. And even if you already feel on track with your purpose, the quiz can help you with important distinctions. And if you're completely new to purpose and your soul's calling, this can be a crucial first step. So go to karmamarshall.com forward slash quiz to take this fun, free, and illuminating quiz. Now, let's get back to the podcast. I said, well, no, I had no idea. But that wasn't the reason why I wanted to go on there. The reason why I wanted to go on it was purely to take control of my life. So, Mm. and the way it worked, and you do, you fall off the face of the earth. So anyway, went to the casting meeting and got through the first casting and then got into the second one. And the funniest thing was they said, okay, you come into this room, you got to walk in this room and there's big, huge doors. And my middle name is Wayne. So it's John Wayne. And yes, I am named (laughs) after the man himself. And I had RM Williams boots on, I had jeans on and I'm a large man. And I've walked into this room and it's dark and there's a table there with producers on there, psychologists on there. And there's one chair with a microphone. So I've walked in and I've closed the door behind me, but it absolutely slammed. And I've walked in and I've gone, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And the first thing this guy looks up and he says, now I know why your name is John Wayne, because you look like him <laughs> walking in the room. So then they just ask questions or, you know, about why I was there, what my thoughts were. And I still hadn't told anybody that how far I'd got with this. And then a week later, I got this letter. You were invited to be a participant in The Biggest Loser. Come down to Sydney. And this was the first Biggest Loser in Australia, right? Like the first time they'd ever done it? No, this was the third one. So it was the highest rating, season three it was. But I'd never watched it, so I didn't know what I was in for. Whereas when I got into the house, I remember this moment where the trainers were running down the driveway and everyone's all excited about it. And, of course, I'm excited just being there. And I turned around to somebody and said, who are those people? I said, well, that's the trainers, Shannon and Michelle. And, oh, okay, no worries. And they said, don't you know anything about this show? I said, no, I've never watched it before. And they said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here to lose weight. But what I worked out was there were other people there that either wanted to become famous or wanted to win the prize. So when you think about the three types of people that go on there, it's win the money, become famous, or lose weight. And I was there for one reason only, and that was to lose weight and to take control of my life. So today, almost to the day 15 years later, it's next month, it's 15 years later, I would say there's probably out of the 30 of us that went in there, probably three that have kept it off. But they were all the people that went in there for the right reasons. It was to change their life and reinvent themselves rather than become famous or win some money. Yeah, so interesting, eh? Mm, it was an extraordinary journey during it and it was probably a bigger journey afterwards, I think, which still continues to this day. So tell us a little bit about the journey of being on The Biggest Loser. I guess the journey was what it was, it was this roller coaster ride of emotions because 
you are locked away from the world. What you see on reality TV is, see, people look at reality TV and they think that the contestants know what's going on, but we don't. The only time we know what's going on is when we're watching it on a screen. And that's, I actually ended up the, the end of that. And when I left, I sat and watched the entire series and I was still training for finale. So I'm out in the street and I'm seeing all of these people. But you couldn't talk to anybody. There was no newspapers. There was no TV. You were virtually locked off. And one of the hardest parts was my oldest daughter was having my first child grandson. And I knew that she was being induced. And I knew the exact day. But I hadn't heard anything. And then I kept sort of saying to the producers and the trainers, you know, I need to speak to my daughter. And they kept rejecting that. But they were filming everything. And you don't get that. And then all of a sudden they snip it all up and cut it all up. And then that's what happens on TV. And then you go, oh my God. Oh, did you cut that part out? Oh, did you add that part? I guess the best part about the whole thing for me in the show is I was very true to myself because I wasn't there for any other reason. And I knew nothing about the show. So it was really just me. I had my ups and downs like anybody. I'm a human being. I had moments in there that were really hard and you could see that. And I guess you'd take it out on other people. But generally speaking, I was very, very happy with the way they portrayed me in the whole show. But I also had a very different story than everybody else because of I was the oldest person that had been in there. I had a grandson coming and there was this whole story based around this guy at 44 trying to get his life back in order. And there's a really important part that I've missed here. At the start of the recording of the show, I was told I can't become the biggest loser nor can I win the prize because they didn't want to dangle a carrot in front of me for me to train harder. On top of that, I had a different training regime to everybody else. I couldn't get my heart rate over 100 beats per minute and I could only walk three 40-minute sessions a day. And they said, if you don't want to do that, you can leave. And to me, it was like, well, I'm here for a reason. I've come this far. The money was not the reason why I'm here. So I'm happy to stay, but I would like to learn a little bit about nutrition because if if this is the only way I can train where everybody else is doing boot camp stuff, I need to really focus on my nutrition because that will become my my shining light, I guess. And this was all because of liability, because thinking that you'd had a heart attack for liability reasons, they couldn't have you train too hard or make you want that prize too much. Correct. Correct. That was their rationale. So I'll let them hold that thought and think that they, <laughs> but more than life, they just wanted to build a character and push my buttons to certain points of the show. So anyway, so that was that. But the funniest part was I did and I walked and I reckon that I can walk about eight Ks an hour if I go full on. And I walked and never missed a session. I wasn't drinking. Now, remembering, taking a step back, the weekend before I went into the show, I drank a whole carton of Jim Beam and Coke cans at a party. That was like my last supper. I was very drunk, but that's how much I used to drink back then as well as smoke and all of those things. So now I'm not drinking. I'm walking three 40-minute sessions. I'm focusing my diet. And the first weigh-in, I lost 10.6 kilos. It was in a 10-day period. All of a sudden, Australia's gone, my God, what's this guy doing? Because all the other contestants, they're doing boot camp training. And I'm losing more weight by just walking and focusing on my food. And that was a continued trend throughout the show. And then halfway through the show, I was coming second by 00.3%. So now I started to make them look a little bit silly because I wasn't training as hard as anybody else, but my numbers were as good as anybody else. And then they put another set of handcuffs on me to slow me down. And I kind of said, well, this doesn't make sense. You know, I've lost 25 kilos at that stage. So let me loose. I'm, uh, at the moment, I'm like a lion in a cage. I just want to train hard and I want to complete this. And whether I won or whether I didn't, I wanted to have a lot of success with what I do. I wanted the results. So anyway, I, I, one of the rules where I had to train with a paramedic every time I trained and this one particular time, the paramedic wasn't, didn't want to come with me. So I went and walked on a treadmill. So I got thrown off the show because I apparently broke the rules. The story is the story. And if you watch it, it's on Prime Video now. At season three, you'll see this story and there's things on there that people don't see, but that's what it was. They built a character. The bonus of that and the benefit of that is when I got out, it drove me even harder because they said to me also, you're not going to be on finale. Now that broke my heart. 
that really upset me because I held a vision of what I would look like at the finale. And the vision was really silly vision. I wanted to wear a pair of Levi jeans, which I'd never owned in my life because I was too overweight. And I wanted to ride my Harley Davidson on the stage. So <laughs> I, I held that vision for a long time and then they took it away from me. So I just said, okay, right, fine. I'm going to train parallel. I'll watch this and I'll train every day, just like I was in the show. And I'm now at home and I'm watching it on TV. And then I lost about another 25 kilos when I was off the show. And you lost how many on the show? In total, I lost uh, 25 on the show, 25 mm-hmm. back at home. So in total, I lost 47.3 kilos. And that's just for our America listeners in Canada. That's like 103 pounds. Yes. So it's- it's significant. <laughs> Very significant. I didn't even know myself. I was looking at things that I hadn't seen for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way. <laughs> um, and it was funny because I have an appendix scar and I'd never seen it before. And it was the first moment and I'm, I'm in the mirror in the house and I'm drying myself and I've gone, oh, my God, I can see my scar. And that just motivated him. It's funny, in a weight loss situation, it's the small things that motivate you to keep going. It's the losing a centimeter around your waist. It's the kilo on the scale. It's the whatever. So so that just motivated me even more. Then that all happened. I got off. I'd lost the win. And then I got this phone call from the producers to say, it was actually the psychologist kept ringing me. And they were saying, you know, how are you, John? And I was kind of thinking, this doesn't make sense. If then I want me to go to finale, why are you still talking to me? And then I thought, you know what, I'm going to tell the psychologist what I want her to hear. So I then started taking control of what I wanted to do and try and get back into this. And then eventually I got a phone call from a producer and a producer said to me, look, we want to invite you along to the finale, but you can't be involved in it. And I said, really, really? Are you going to kick me any harder? I'm going to be in the audience watching all these people I train with and you're not going to let me get up there. No, 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 no. So anyway, I've gone down there and I'm in the audience and they stand me up. They say, John, we'd like you to stand up in the crowd, went through everything. And they said, would you like to join us on stage? So then I did do the finale and I got onto the finale. And for me, it was beautiful. And I was so happy that I got there. My daughter was there with my grandson, my wife, my two trainers were there who are amazing people. They actually own a Jets franchise, as do I do today. So I still see these people 15 years later. And they were so helpful. They were amazing, those two people, Warren and Jill. So then from there, the Heart Foundation reached out to me and wanted me to be an ambassador for them. And I was an ambassador for the Door Knock Appeal two years running. And then they brought out this program called Heart Moves, which is a fairly sedentary type of exercise. If you talk about the Borg scale from one to 10, it was around about a three And it was really for older people that you take. So they made me the ambassador for that and put me through this course. I got a scholarship to become a master trainer um, through Australian Institute of Fitness. And then my life changed totally. I was now out of retail because what I figured was, and this is what I believe, when you want to reinvent yourself, you have to let go of everything in the past. You have to let go of everything you know to start again. When I left hotels, and got into retail, I started from the bottom again. But I made sure I learned everything on the way up. Because when I become a manager, or when I become a state manager, I need to know every aspect. When I got out of that and got into the fitness industry, same thing. You know, I was cleaning treadmills. I remember a guy walked up to me one day, and it was in the same town as where my Harvey Norman store was. And a guy that knew me in the town walked up to me and he saw me cleaning a treadmill. He said, what are you doing, John? And he kind of looked down at me and I said, well, I'm cleaning a treadmill. He said, that is so beyond you. And I said, well, why do you think that's beyond me? He said, well, you used to run a multi-million dollar store. I said, yeah, well, now I don't. Now I need to learn how to run a multi-million dollar fitness business. So for me to do that properly, I need to do everything from the bottom. And then I'll understand how the whole industry and business works. And then I'll work myself up from there. So I became a trainer for three years. And I loved it. I love training people. I actually trained more women than what I train men and more women around about 40 to 50 year old women that were married that had kids and stuff like that. And, and they needed to go through life change. So I came up with this concept of what I believed happens to women at that age. Would you like me to share that with you? 
I would love that. I know our listeners would love that too. Okay. So this is what I saw and it was very consistent. And I swear I was a little bit scared that one day I might find a husband outside of the gym that wanted to kill me or something. But I saw these beautiful women and if I put it this way, so before, if you take a woman back to their, when they're 16 year old, they might be Miss Jones. So then they grow up and they're still Miss Jones. They got their identity and they love who they are and that's it. So then they get married and now they become Mrs. David. And all of a sudden, Miss Jones is kind of just filtering at the back and now she's Mrs. So then she becomes a mum. So now she's mum, Mrs. David, but Miss Jones is gone. She's forgotten who she was because she's a mum and a wife. And I made it my mission to get them back to Miss Jones again, to be their own person again, to not have to rely on everybody or everything. I hate the old school, a woman's job is in the home. And I I don't like any of that stuff. When I was a young person in hotels, I was a trainee manager and my manager was a woman. And she was stunning, beautiful blonde haired woman. And she went to the Melbourne Cup carnival one day and I'm out the back unloading this truck in 40 degree temperature in Victoria. She come back from the carnival. She had high heels on, looked a million dollars. She stood there and looked at me. She flicked the high heels off in her beautiful dress and got on the back of the truck with me. And from that point on, I'd never not respected a woman in business because I believe if you can do what I can do and I can do what you can do, equal, equal, equal. So it really used to annoy me because, I, you know, these women would open up to me and it just irritated me that they had lost their identity. So I made it my mission to help them find themselves again and find their identity again. And, and it was great. It was just they become different people. And I had two run marathons and it was just extraordinary. So I love that aspect of being a trainer. But after three years of doing it, so if you put it into perspective, going from retail, 100 hours a week to becoming a trainer. 25 hours a week, sitting on the beach, training myself. It was beautiful for three years. I loved it. It kind of gave me that peace or relaxation to collect everything again and where I needed to go and what direction. So after that three years, it was time to go, well, you know what, John, I love training people, but I miss business. I miss big business. I love the human body. I love everything about it, but it's not a passion for me to have further education because I just love running business. So I applied for a position with Jets Fitness way back 2000, I don't know, 2012, 2013, something like that, as what they call a business performance manager. I was overseeing 23 gyms then. Now I really knew minimal about the fitness industry, but I knew a lot about retail and hospitality. So I bought all these new things into the fitness industry. Because one thing I find in business is you always hear I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been doing this for 40 years. Yeah, well, that's great. But hey, things change. You Mm -hmm. have to reinvent. You have to adapt. You have to look at example conversation we're having before about TikToks. To me, TikTok was a clock on a wall. Now I've got to work out and understand what TikTok is. And so I need to do that. But it was the same when people sit there in the fitness industry. They're going, you know, I've been doing this. This is the way we do it. So I then started bringing in different ideas, retail philosophies, hospitality philosophies, because if you think about those three businesses, they're all service-related businesses. It's all about a customer. So I'd bring those in and it really helped me train a lot of club managers back then. And within three months, I got promoted to national training manager for Jets. So now I was training all the new managers, all the new franchisees, even new head office staff coming in on sales and standards and leadership and KPIs and all of these different types of format and I found my true love Mm. and my true love was teaching people I never realized that I'd been doing it all my life because you have a team of 20 staff or 20 team members and you're teaching them how to do things but you don't have a training hat on you have a leadership hat on but then now I'm in this room and I've got 16 young people with me and they're half of my age and they're just in awe and they're listening to all this stuff and I've gone my God, this is like an adrenaline rush. So four days every month, I would train all these new managers. And I swear after that, it was like I had jet lag because my mission was never to lose anybody. I wanted to hold everybody in that room. It was so important to me. So that's where it evolved with Jets. And then my gym became available, which was Jets Noosa. I heard it was up for sale. It's my hometown. 
I'd kind of had enough of the corporate world at that stage as well. So decided to buy a business with my partner. So we bought Jets Fitness is now June next year will be 10 years we've had that for. 10 years. Wow. 10 years. And you had a lot of foresight with that too, because I remember I had a conversation with you that you bought the whole upper level. And then of course the gym started in one area and you've expanded, but you had a real vision when you first started. Yeah. It was, it's again, I guess it's the same thing when you can sit there and go, you know, I've been doing this for so long and this many years and you, it's what I call having blinkers on. You're actually not seeing outside of your peripheral vision. And if I do anything, it's about peripheral vision. If I want to understand something, I will travel. In the fitness industry, before this all happened, I'd been to America, I'd been to Europe, I'd been to China. People over there going, what are you doing in China? Well, I want to see what's going on. I want to understand the fitness industry. I want to know the trends. I want to know all of this. So before we bought the business, that stage it was only 375 square meters. But my education told me that these small 247 boxes are going to become on an average of 500 to 700 square meters. And that's what they need to be. Because I also knew about functional training coming to Australia. Because it was very big in America, but it wasn't that big in Australia. So I said to my partner, unless we can secure the rest of that back area, we're not buying this business. Gave that explanation why. And sure enough, because of that foresight, we're still there 10 years later. We have just hit our highest number ever. But we're now a 500 square meter club. And we're about to be a 712 square meter club, hopefully early in the new year. But that keeps me current. So I guess reinventing yourself, recreating yourself, one of the biggest take-homes is you've got to stay current. You've got to understand what's happening in the moment or in the future. Forget about the past. The past is gone. Finito. And you just focus on the future and, and educate yourself. Just love doing it. You've got to love what you're doing. It's fun. There's so many great takeaways. Like through this whole conversation, you've always wanted to be in control of your life. And taking that personal responsibility for not happy or it's not working, being willing to make that change. But then also having that humble attitude of listening to other people who might say you need to change your appearance or you might need to scrub toilets <laughs> and not being above that. Agree. Agree. Look, at the end of the day, and I'll argue this blue in the face with anybody, only we have control. We have control of who we are, where we want to go. We can sit and bitch and whinge as much as we want and complain about things. but only you have the control to go forward. When I was suffering from depression, it got pretty deep. You know, I used to come home at night and the show I was talking about before, this is the funny thing, the show The Getaway is a travel show. So I would come home, I would drink beer and I would watch this show just to get away from the world. It took me somewhere else and I was depressed. I didn't talk to anybody, didn't want to see anybody, but I got to that point where I knew things had to change. And this was the biggest changing and pivotal point when I got out of that. When I went to my doctor and he prescribed antidepressants, he said to me, listen, John, I really don't like doing this, but you need to do this if you do have a chemical imbalance, but I'm going to give you one tip. When you feel that you can go off them, then you need to make that decision, but only you can make that decision because after a year of being on them, it's probably not going to make any difference to you at all. So when I was on The Biggest Loser, I was halfway through the program. I'd lost the weight, feeling very confident with myself and who I was at that stage. As I said to you before, confident in business, but had no confidence in myself. All of a sudden, I'm looking at this body in a mirror going, my oh God, who is this person? So I felt really good about myself and I made that decision. And I weaned myself off my antidepressants on the show and backed out and I haven't had one since. But that was the moment where I knew it was time to, pardon the pun, jump and go, this is it. You ready? Take control, John. Go forward. The black dog barks at my back door all the time, as it does in everyone's home. But you can go and take the dog for a walk and entertain what it's trying to do, or you can just say, yeah, no, stay in the backyard. I'm not interested. We have that control. And I find it hard to understand why people just don't realize that they have so much control over themselves. Because it's just the way you think is what changes it. Do you wake up in the morning and go, yeah, no, I've got this defeatist attitude? Or do you wake up in the morning and go, you know what? I'm going to go forward with this. I'm going to try hard. I'm going to train harder. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to eat less. I'm going to do whatever. You have that control. And yes, you're going to have situations where 
you go backwards. But my life, if I put it in a nutshell, has always been about going backwards to go forwards. It's two steps back, three steps forward, four steps back, one step forward. But you know what? That's life. That's the way it is. I turn 60 next year and I'm so excited about it. Who's supposed to be excited about turning 60, Carmen? Who? <laughs> Me. Definitely, definitely, John. I remember, I think it was a month ago, you're like, I'm going to get into the best shape of my life. And you're like, in my 60s. And I think that's amazing. You know, like, that's what we should look forward to as we get older. Like, why wouldn't we? Yeah, you know, like, great. it doesn't end when we're 50. Yeah. yeah I think it's a beautiful attitude. So the so snowball of, next- sorry, you're funny you should say that. You're about to say to me, what's next, John? Well, what's next is happening. So it was only, what am I into my sixth week? Two months ago, I got offered a position to become a general manager for a, a little gym company. Well, they actually jet gyms down in Brisbane and they want to scale their business and end up opening multiple clubs. So they reached out and they offered me the position as their general manager. So now I'm down there three days a week in Brisbane and I'm looking after their clubs down there as well as looking after my club up here. And I swear it is just the most amazing thing. I have an IT guy that's 18 years old and I'm in awe of him just because of the stuff that he's teaching me. And I guess if I talk about a take home now, the average age in this business down there is 25 years old. My bosses are younger than my children, but yet, I'm not going in there saying, I've been doing this for 30 years and 40 years. I'm going in there saying, tell me what you think you want. Tell me how you think this business should operate. It's the two ears, one mouth. Listen, listen, listen. So I've spent five weeks under the hood of the business, looking at how it works, watching, talking, asking people who they are, getting to know everything. And the simple part of it is now I have a strategy. Strategy started yesterday. And last night, I got a message from a young girl who did something that I've asked them to do. And she was so excited and so happy. And it was almost like for me, a drop the mic moment. I've done my job. I've done what I'm supposed to do. So for me now, to be able to take all these young people on this ride is really, really exciting. And that will be my swan song. And I will say that's it for me. I I'm, I'm, think I'm done with business. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I, I did meet. I, about you. <laughs> yeah, well, I did meet this dude last night. I went out for dinner and I met this guy from Brazil, and he was seventy-two years old, and he looked just spectacular. I'm going, my God, you've just motivated me, maybe more. And he's not retired, and he's seventy-two. So we'll see. We'll see what happens from this point on. So, is there anything that we haven't covered in the podcast that you'd like to share in terms of being able to pivot going forward in life with the attitude that you have? I think it's just, you have to take control yourself. No one's going to do it for you. You know, you can reach out, a psychologist, for example. Now, I love psychologists and I've been to psychologists before. And I had one that took me through a really bad moment in my life and she was extraordinary. But they're really planting seeds. You have to take that seed and make it grow and develop because they don't actually sit there and say, you should be doing this and you should be doing that. They're almost really saying, what if you had this mindset? What if you did that? And people talk about the power of the mind. Trust me, do not underestimate how powerful it is because it is the most powerful tool that we have in our life. You have control over your thoughts at all time. If there's a bad thought, you're either going to let it grow and become a mountain, or if it's a good thought, you're going to either squash that good thought and let the mountain take it over. So you've got to get that balance and you've got to, I guess, just believe in who you are. You have to believe in who you are because no one else is going to. It's like the same thing. If you can't love yourself, who's going to love you? And no one else will create the life you want except for you. Like it all. 100%. All, yeah. I'm not going to sit there when I'm old and gray. Well, I'm, I'm both of those already. So I'll just rephrase that. I'm not going to sit there and blame anybody for where I end up because it's everything that I do is where I'm going to end up. And that's up to me. It's totally in my control to do that. Yes, we need help around us. We need support around us throughout our life. You know, one of my philosophies these days is it's not about what you have. It's not about where you've been. It's not about what you've done. It's about how much you can share. So for me right now in my life, I've got 60 years of experience on this planet in three different industries. If I didn't share that with people, well, I think that's pretty wrong. So I want to share what I know. And to me, that's where my mission is now. 
And I get to see that twice a week whenever we're in the gym. It's when you're there too and you're training the team and the excitement and the seeing them go through the levels and the positions that you're giving them. It's just wonderful. You can tell you just love what you do. Are you stalking me in the gym? Ooh, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> John, this so, has been so wonderful. Where can people find you? I have my Instagram page, which is just John Morell, J-O-H-N-M-O-R-R-A-L-L. But that's probably the best point of call. Go to my Insta. I've got a Facebook page as well, but yeah, reach out. I'll put that in the show notes so everyone can get it easily. Thank you, John, so much for your time and just sharing your journey and your wisdom and just really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Well, Carmen, thank you so much for inviting me onto this. It's been very enjoyable. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, I'd absolutely love if you left a review on iTunes. It really helps me to get the podcast out there to support more people just like you to create soulful lives. And as a thank you, I'd love to send you my 20 personal affirmations for manifesting an aligned, magical, and fulfilling life. To access this freebie, simply send a screenshot of your review to soulcraft at karmamarshall.com, and I'll send you my favorite affirmations and mantras straight to your inbox. All my love, and I'll see you on the next episode.